In this course, you'll hear me use the terms pattern and anti-pattern quite often. Well, what do I mean by these terms? Well, in IT, when we talk about a pattern, generally we're talking about some sort of commonly used architectural model that solves a problem. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about how a, a company has implemented a, a particular pattern to solve a storage performance problem. And that, that means that, that this is a, a common architectural model that many other organizations within the industry uh, have used in the past successfully. When we talk about an anti-pattern, we're talking about an architectural model which generally leads to some sort of unsatisfactory outcome. And what's interesting is that most anti-patterns started out as a pattern at some point in time. If you look back in history, there are many cases where organizations throughout the marketplace were following some sort of common practice, some sort of common set, uh, some sort of common pattern. But over time, people began to realize that th this this particular pattern or architectural model was was actually making things worse. And so a new pattern evolved to to overcome the problems exhibited by the anti-pattern. And one of our goals in this course is to identify both patterns and anti-patterns. Patterns become the new tools in our toolkit that we can use to solve problems. And anti-patterns then are the, the sort of things that we should look out for and, and try to avoid within our organizations. Let's start out by looking at four common patterns that you will encounter when building out distributed infrastructure in the cloud. And these four patterns include load balancing, caching, message queues, and database sharding. The first pattern I want to talk about is load balancing. And load balancing is, a, is an extremely common and useful service when you're building out a distributed architecture. Essentially, a load balancer is a service which takes incoming requests from your, your customers, from your users, and routes those requests to a system within your environment. You might have an, a, an application that is running across dozens of web servers and a fleet of servers. And the, the requests that are coming in that are made to that application go through a load balancer layer. And the load balancer then just decides which server in the fleet of servers should handle that request. The load balancer is pretty smart. It can, it'll, it'll attempt to distribute those requests evenly across your web servers, and it will monitor the health of the servers in that web server fleet. And if it sees that a server has failed, then it will stop routing requests to that failed server. In other words, it has the ability to sort of, sort of automatically uh, reroute requests around systems which have failed. Well, how does the load balancer distribute uh, the, the requests? It can use a variety of different algorithms and to, to determine how to route its requests to the backend web servers. It might follow a sort of a, a random methodology where every incoming request is going to be sent to some random server. 
it could follow what's called a round robin methodology where basically each incoming re request is sent to a different server sort of sequentially. Imagine you had five servers and, and they were server one, server two, server three, server four, and server five. The first request would go to server one, the second request would go to server two, the third to server three, and so on. And once it reached server five, it would then roll over back to server one. And there are a, a variety of other algorithms that load balancers can implement. Things like least load and weighted round robin. I'm not going to go into detail in this lecture, but you can do some research on your own if you're interested in understanding more about load balancing algorithms. The bottom line is that the load balancer is responsible for taking that request and distributing it to an available web server. Next, look, let's look at the caching pattern. Caching means essentially that you have some sort of device or service which is going to be storing requests. And the caching service, its purpose is to essentially accelerate access to data and to improve the response of those requests. For example, if you have an application and it's reading data from a hard drive, the data read process, as you probably know, is pretty slow. Hard drives are, are fairly slow storage devices versus if the data would be read from memory. Memory access on a, on a computer is very, very fast in orders of magnitude faster than reads from a hard drive, even if it's an SSD drive. So what, what operating systems do and applications oftentimes do is they create a caching layer, a caching service, where commonly accessed data is stored in memory as well as on disk. And so the application if it's accessing commonly accessed data, it will first try to read that data from memory. Because if it can read it from memory, it's going to read it much faster than if it were on disk. The challenge for the caching service then is to try to optimize the, the available memory that's been allocated to it and, and try to ensure that the the information, the data that's stored in, the, in, in cache, in memory, is the right data. Oftentimes, you'll find a, a, a caching service front-ending something like a database service, where an application will communicate with the cache service before performing a query on the database because a query on a database is going to be an expensive operation. So the bottom line here is that we use a caching pattern, a caching service to accelerate access to, to commonly accessed data within our platform. The next pattern is what we call a message queue. We use a message queue pattern to decouple services within our application architecture. We have two types of services at any given point in time. We have services that are producing data and producing messages, and we have services which are consuming data consuming those messages. The message bus is sort of the connective tissue that connects our services which are producing messages to those services which are consuming messages. Well, why is this message bus important? Well, imagine you had a situation where 
you had more message producers than you had message consumers. You could quickly find yourself in a situation where the message producers in your platform, those services, are overwhelming the message consumers. And, and li- this can lead to all kinds of undesirable uh, I- events. You might have a, a, a service outage or you might have uh, a, a serious performance impact on your platform. The, it, you might have cases within your platform where messages need to be handled asynchronously, meaning that you have one service that's generating a message and you'll have other services that consume that message, but those services don't need to consume the message right away. They don't need to take action immediately. In that case, the message has to be stored somewhere. It has to be stored on some sort of queue where it can then later on be picked up by the message consumers. And this allows us to support what we call an event-driven application architecture. I'm going to spend part of a lecture later on in the course talking about event-driven architectures because many of the cloud-native applications that we are building today are built around this sort of event-driven architecture model. Message queues are incredibly important in, in, in these cloud native applications. And companies like Amazon likely run thousands, maybe, maybe hundreds and hundreds of thousands of message queues within their computing environments. The last pattern that I want to cover in this lecture is database sharding. And database sharding addresses one of the biggest challenges that we have when we're scaling out our platform in a distributed architecture. And the, the problem we, we encounter is how do, we, how do we store and access large sets of data that are too big to fit on a single server. I mean, imagine you're an organization like Facebook. It's not possible to put all of your data on a single server, on a single database server. There isn't a a physical server anywhere in the world that can store all that data, much less do it it performantly. in order to store massive amounts of data within a distributed arch- architecture and, and in order to support the kind of scale that we oftentimes need to, to support, where we're talking about thousands or millions of, of customers, we need a way to partition our database. We need a way to slice it up into multiple pieces in a, in a, in a distributed fashion so that we can scale out our database just like we scale out our, our, our computing infrastructure, our application infrastructure. And we can do that using a pattern called shards. Essentially, shards represent a portion or a partition of a database. We, we take our our data and our database, and we slice it up into smaller pieces, each one of which is a shard, and we store each shard on a different physical server. We then have a, a, a database platform which can read the data from multiple shards. And, and it's, it, we're able to query the database and, and the, the database server is able to essentially, you know, query data from each of those, those shard partitions and join it together in an aggregated response back to the application. Now, there are, as you can imagine, there are all kinds of challenges 
associated with sharding your database. You, you know, the, the, one of the big questions is, well, how, how exactly do you partition your data? Do you just put each table? If you have a relational database, do you have each table, you know, that lives on a separate database? Do you actually slice up your data within tables and, and partition it that way? And there are, there are definitely several different models um, that you can follow, and much of it's dependent on the actual database platform that you're using. You also have to deal with the challenges of trying to balance your data across multiple servers. You don't want a situation where you have one of your shards which has all of your frequently accessed data on it, you know, while your other shards are, are relatively unused. That will create sort of a hot spot within your database architecture. And these are, these are challenges that oftentimes, uh, you know, are solved by, by the database vendors. Here's an example of sharding a relational database. I might have a database table called user. In this case, it has four users in it. And if I were to shard it, then basically I'm splitting it into two databases, each of which has a user table. But the first database has the, the first two records and the second database has the 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 third and fourth records in it. This is a, obviously a very simplistic example. Imagine that instead of four, in, instead of four records, we have you know something like 400 million records, and we might have a couple million records in each in each database, and we might have a dozen different database servers or something that are are that our data is sharded across. One of the, the common database platforms that you'll find in distributed architectures is what we call NoSQL platforms, which stands for not only SQL. NoSQL platforms are a bit different than our traditional relational database. Uh, you know, platforms, which have really ruled the world for many decades now. But over the last 10 years or so, NoSQL databases have, have really made a, a big impact in uh, modern application architectures. And the primary goal of NoSQL databases is basically to store the data in a way that is it you know sort of represents the way the data is actually used there are many different types of NoSQL databases in the marketplace and what you'll find is that generally you pick a database that aligns with the a, a particular use case and there are four major types of NoSQL databases that you'll find in in the marketplace you'll have key value databases. And we'll look at a few of these in the course, like Redis and uh, Memcache and um, even something like DynamoDB, which we'll use a little bit, is, uh, is, is probably considered a, you could consider it to be a key value database. You have columnar databases like HBase and AWS Redshift, which is a, a common database platform used in data warehousing. You have document databases like MongoDB and uh, AWS DynamoDB is also a document database. And then finally, you have graph databases like Neo4j and AWS Neptune. Graph databases are really cool and you'll commonly find them used in things like like uh, social media applications where you need to be able to store relationships between different people. One of the, one of the other thoughts that I want to leave you with as, as we sort of wrap up this lecture 
is that when we are building out distributed systems, we, we try to follow many of the same concepts that we learned in, in when, when we were introduced to software engineering. In software engineering, we learned that loose coupling is highly desirable when building out software components. It's, it's easier to maintain, it's easier to refactor components if they're loosely coupled. It's easier to do, you know, sort of break fix work and, and uh, eliminate hidden dependencies. It's just way more flexible. Software, which is, it has loosely coupled components, is, is much more flexible and easier to maintain. The same is true when working with distributed architecture. When we build out distributed architecture, we also try to use loosely coupled components. And that's one reason why you see something like a microservices architecture. You, you see uh, those sort of architectures feature, featuring prominently in the cloud because a microservices architecture represents a multitude of of loosely coupled components, loosely coupled services. And when we're scaling these services uh, in the cloud and, and when we're scaling our services in a, a distributed architecture, there are a couple things I want you to keep in mind. Oftentimes I see people make a, a mistake when they are initially trying to test the scalability and the, the performance of their distributed application. They might be testing the performance of that application in a smaller environment, like a, a test environment. Maybe even it's, it, maybe it's just even running in virtual machines or in containers on their own laptop. And the mistake that people oftentimes make is that they assume that the performance they see from their application that's running in a small environment will translate to the performance of that application running in a large distributed system. That's generally not the case. What you'll find is that applications that are running on a single server or even a small set of servers are going to experience different bottlenecks and constraints than applications running in a larger distributed architecture. Just because you have doubled the amount of CPU or memory in a system doesn't necessarily mean you're going to double the performance of your application. Your, your application might not be CPU constrained or memory constrained. Oftentimes, applications are going to be I.O. constrained, meaning that the performance of the application is really going to be limited by the performance of the, the storage infrastructure or of the networking infrastructure. If you have multiple services that are communicating with, with one another, if those services live on the same physical server, they might be able to communicate using inter-process communications, which is a super fast communication mechanism. If those services now are running in a distributed architecture on multiple physical servers connected via a network, the communication between those services now, the speed is going to be, going to be limited by that network. And that network is going to be magnitudes slower, orders of magnitudes slower than, than that inter-process memory communication. So you have to be really careful, really wary of, uh, of, of these constraints as you scale up your application platform in a distributed architecture.